The following is a non-verdict-based research horses show. The stats of the individual characters are not taken into consideration when determining aspects of the fight. However, the characters themselves are going to be represented in their fullest capacity outside of stats. This is versus universe. Scars. Sometimes they lead to pain. Sometimes to regret. But for these two sharpshooters, their scars remind them of only one thing. The past. Minoth, the flesh-eater blade of Adam and Amalthus from Xenoblade Chronicles, and Lushu, the free-shooter subordinate of Xehanort and the Master of Masters from Kingdom Hearts. Let's begin. Long ago, there was a man named Klaus. This man was enchanted by the prospect of giving birth to a new universe, since the one he currently lived in was in a constant state of war. Using a device known as the Conduit, he opened the gateways into dimensions untraveled by man. One of these dimensions is the home of Shulk, heir to the Monado. But our focus today stays with Klaus, as his own universe was torn asunder. This meant that someone had to design a way for life to continue as the architect of this new world. And as repentance for his hubris, Klaus thought that he would create new life where he had destroyed the old. And so, he covered the world in a thick layer of clouds dense enough to swim through that would come to be known as the Cloud Sea. Next, he created the first forms of life on this new world, Titans. Titans are gigantic creatures that can themselves house life similar to how bacteria would manifest on a human skin. These life forms that would come to live on the backs of Titans are twofold, the average human and the blades. Blades, unlike humans, are able to control the elements through their genes, though the specific element is unique to every blade. These elements include fire, water, ice, wind, earth, lightning, light, and dark. Despite this power, to fully utilize it, blades must have a solid bond with the humans that awaken them. Thus, the relationship between a blade and their driver was born. Blades are typically formed inside a titan, but there are two exceptions to this, the Aegises. Housed in the elusive world tree where the mystical architect resides, these Aegises might be better known by their names as blades. Malos and Mithra. Malos in particular was awoken by the quester at Malthus of the Indolite Titan. Uh, quester is just a religious title, don't worry about that. But before Malos, there was one blade that Amalthus had awoken. This blade is Minoth. Minoth is a dark element blade and uses a unique weapon called gun knives. These weapons can freely switch between a dual shooting pistol-esque pair of firearms and a pair of darkness infused daggers. While in their gun form, they can fire off basically as many bullets as Minoth desires. And in terms of switching, well, there's no recoil at all. Minoth can switch between gun and knife mode to his heart's content, and he has a few abilities that take advantage of that fact. With Espada, continuously slashes at the opponent before sending a boatload of bullets their way. With Cyclone, he spins around while sending bullet after bullet his opponent's way. With Cruciata, he slides into position before spinning back up while firing along the way. And... With a scorpion, he can pass along his weapons with his driver while continuously dealing damage, ending with a simultaneously teamwork-led slashing gunfire. Along with these special abilities, Minoth also has techniques known as arts that he can use with some extra effects depending on the art. For example, his main art, known as Duolo, has the effect of erasing the attack potency of all other arts and gaining the aggro of whatever enemy he's facing. With Hurricane, at the cost of 10% of his health, he can gain immunity for the duration of the attack. With Hilo, the next art used has a boost in attack, and with Dorso, he can raise his and his allies' accuracy. Minoth was one of many blades that were experimented on by the Indoline Praetorium, but he was among the only ones to walk away alive. These experiments made Minoth something known as a flesh eater, a being scientifically created to make a super powerful blade without the need for a driver. Unfortunately, Minoth's experiment was both a failure and a success. A success in the fact that they made Minoth a fully automated blade, but a failure in the sense that Minoth now ages like humans do. Blades are essentially immortal until their driver dies, making them retreat into their core crystals. After this, another driver can awaken them, but the blade will retain no memories of their previous life. However, if you shatter a blade's core crystal, they will be permanently dead. Given this freedom, Minoth was free to leave his driver's side at basically any point. But the true nail in the coffin was when Amalthus revealed his sickly nature to the blade. Amalthus is not a nice dude. Man murders children, wives, fathers, anybody, really. So, uh, good on you, Minoth. Get away from that toxic relationship. Minoth is a girl boss. 
few years had passed from the point Minoth and Amalthus saw each other last, and word got around that the Aegis Mithra and her driver Adam, Prince of Torda, were traveling through the Tartan Titan to take down the other Aegis, Melos. So naturally, Minoth decided to join in on their crusade, traveling with them far and wide on the Titan, specifically bonding with Adam instead of the other two drivers, Hugo and... Laura. Give me a minute, I just, I just gotta cry a little bit. Actually, speaking of Laura, she and her blade Jin developed a new technique known as weapon passing because, I shit you not, they were too poor to afford another weapon. Usually a driver and blade use separate weapons, but not these two. No, they pass the blade back and forth, having each other take turns. This may sound simplistic, but this technique had never been seen before on all rest, and in 500 years is somehow the dominant fighting style used by all drivers. All of the drivers in Laura's party went on to try the technique, including Adam with Minoth. This is what led to their Scorpion attack. While fighting with a driver, Minoth has varying arts depending on where he is positionally. If he's in front, he can use his vanguard arts. If he's in the back, he can use his rear arts to support Adam in the party. But with these techniques and friends in hand, and community level 4, they went to the capital of Torna, Oresco, to face off against Malus once and for all. Despite being an Aegis, they came pretty close to beating Malus until he started cheating by using giant mechs. That's not fair. With these mechs, he completely destroyed the capital beyond repair, leaving Oresco in shambles. Fleeing to the core of the Tordan Titan, Malus waited for his pursuers, and they brought the fight to him. The Battle at Torna was not a pretty sight. There were tons and tons of refugees trying to flee the country, along with Malus's mechs making it near impossible to do so, as well as the wreckage of Oresco making no place in Torna safe. So, it was clear to the group they needed to defeat Malus. And they did, but at a great cost. Two of their own died, one being a driver, which meant two of their blades retreated into their core crystals, and uh, the other one who died was a child. So, uh, not the greatest thing to happen. The Battle of Torna's finest scarred beyond repair. The group disbanded, never to work together again, aside from those two blades that have retreated I mentioned earlier. Minoth in particular wanted to be as far away from his old driver as possible, so he fled to the kingdom of Uriah. He made a settlement entitled Garfon Village and started the Garfon Mercenaries as a way to take in children who were orphaned by war. About 450 years later, he met a driver by the name of Vandam, and it's heavily believed that he lent his dark power to Vandam as his last driver. Eventually, he grew too old and retired to the capital of Araya, Fonsomaima. There he founded a theater troupe in Maimoma Playhouse and wrote a series of plays that told the story of Adam and Mithra. Although he couldn't reveal the full truth of the situation since Amalthus basically ran all of all rest by this point and showcasing his involvement in the collapse of Torna would make Minoth a political target. And uh, he's not looking too great. Yeah, being a flesh eater meant that, just like a human, Minoth aged, albeit very slowly, and he still lived for at least 500 years. Vandom actually died at the hands of Malos, still active all these years later. Rex, the new driver of the Aegis, made Minoth promise that he'd write a play similar to the one about Adam. But to make it about Vandem, Minoth humbly obliged, content to live out the rest of his days in Fonsamaima. But in his prime, there wasn't much that stood in the way of Minoth, the flesh eater. <laughs> hmm? You know, if the architect really does exist, I'd quite like to meet him. Salvation, huh? Long ago, the worlds all lived together in harmony. However, there was one thing that was going to disrupt that harmony. The Keyblade War. Those tasked with guiding young Keyblade wielders, known as the Foretellers, were given a book filled with events from the future, but one sentence rang out louder than others. The war in that place will lead to the defeat and destruction of the light. The world will be enveloped in eternal darkness. This book was written by the Master of Masters, the master of all these Foretellers, and one more person. That person is Lushu. All of his apprentices were given tasks to complete, but Lushu was given the greatest task of all, to make sure the Keyblade War happened. Why he was given this task, we're not quite sure. The story is still ongoing, but the Master of Masters gave Lushu two things to bring with him on his long journey ahead. A Keyblade entitled Gazing Eye, 
in a mysterious black box. Gazing Eye is a special keyblade with a unique ability. It allows the Master of Masters to see through that little eye at the top. This is how he wrote the Book of Prophecies, as he can see into the distant future Gazing Eye has seen. Despite this awesome power bestowed upon him, eventually Lushu realized to further the Master of Masters' plan, he would have to give up his Keyblade, as well as his body. So, he set up with a successor, and a host. The first person he took over was this guy named Brain, who uh, doesn't really matter to us today. The most important thing to note is that Lushu had to eventually give up Gazing Eye, and although he says he gave it to one of the Dandelions, who were the survivors of the Keyblade War, it's pretty clear that he still had it when he took over the body of Brain. Maybe he's just Brain's twin? No, that's stupid. Basically, he gave it up eventually and began living on through more and more people until, by the time a Keyblade Master you may know, Saiyanort, was planning to incite another Keyblade war, Lushu was there as his subordinate under the name of Bragg. I just want you to know that this information I just told you took the Kingdom Hearts series 11 years to tell. Be fucking grateful I didn't talk about Ventus or something like that. Bragg, while working for Xehanort, or the old coot as he would say, had to rely on another weapon besides Gazing Eye. So, what did he pick? Surely in this universe of wacky cartoon characters he'd pick out something at least partially family friendly. So Bragg uses fucking guns. Granted, they are magic guns, but still, they're fucking guns. Despite these guns being magic, he still has a need to reload them. And I know that someone's gonna be like, what about the data finds? He doesn't reload in those, well those fights don't take place in reality. And that's not the real Lushu you're fighting. The real one, in all of his story fights, has to reload his guns. He can shoot a variety of bullets, but his most common are these ones with a white inner part and red outlines. These have proven enough to defeat a horde of Heartless in one fell swoop. He can fire off a metric fuckton of these as well, raining hell on his opponent. Another attack he can use with his weapons is combining them together to make a sniper rifle, setting up shots to trace his target before hitting them dead on in the center. He also can utilize a warp snipe, a kind of projectile that bounces around the arena before going through his opponent multiple times. And finally, he has a version of his Rainmaker attack that uses purple arrows instead of his normal red bullets and works outward for the center of the arena. With these weapons, he took on many a foe, but the most prominent was Terra, a young Keyblade warrior taught by Xehanort and his boyfriend, Ericus. Terra was the one who cut out his eye, making him wear that eye patch for the rest of the series. You know, you'd think a series featuring magical healing spells would be able to cure a cut out eye. Shame, though it was also cut out with magic, so I guess it's a moot point. At this point in the series, Lushu is lying to basically everyone about his true nature, including Xehanort. The man known as Bragg was nothing but a guise to get close to the master through the false pretense of wanting to become a Keyblade master. How ironic. And eventually, at the Keyblade graveyard, a sight all too familiar for Lushu, he witnessed and helped Xehanort achieve the greatest power known in the world, Kingdom Hearts. But only for a split second. There were three heroes there to stop Xehanort's plans, and at the graveyard they did succeed. It's what happened afterwards that led to failure. Xehanort had possessed that Terra guy I mentioned earlier's body, but after a fight with Terra's friend Aqua, good old Nordy boy here got a big old case of amnesia, complete and total erasure of his personality and goals. But Break didn't mind. He knew deep down that Xehanort was still there lying dormant, that curious mind now put to work as a researching assistant to Ansem the Wise. Then, one day, Xehanort remembers who he is and fucking bodies all the humans at Radiant Garden's research facility. While it may seem like he did this to simply kill them all, that was hardly his goal. Instead, Xehanort's plan was to separate all of those present on that day, including himself, into a heartless and nobody. A heartless is a being born from the darkness in one's heart, in which all but a very select few individuals possess. Hell, Sora was the brimming embodiment of positivity and he got turned into a heartless. But nobody is, well... Nobodies are the empty husks left behind by the heartless as they take the original person's heart with them. So yeah, this technically means nobody should be called heartless and heartless should be called nobodies. Fuck me, am I right? So all those people in that research room are now nobodies. Great. That includes Break. Great. Now he needs to put an X somewhere in his name so that Semnus, the nobody of Xehanort, don't ask about the name, I swear, it's just gonna confuse you more, can track his whereabouts. You know what? 
Frank has always been a bit of an extra guy. Put that X at the front and you got Zigbar. Zigbar has all the abilities of his human counterpart, but they seem to be amplified with what's known as the power of nothingness. No, this isn't a Ryu reference, it's an energy source just like Light and Darkness in Kingdom Hearts. It's not used as much as those two, but it for sure exists. Uncle Ziggy can teleport all over the place, float in midair, and walk upside down on an invisible ceiling. By the way, every member of this group of nobodies, now calling themselves Organization 13, has an elemental power. Zigbar's is space, because the power of space isn't powerful as fuck compared to fire, I guess. With his power, he can also reshape any arena that he's fighting into his whim. Now a member of this... cult, Lucio had a new purpose to his days. Instead of serving Xehanort, he was now serving Xehanort's nobody. Like, my god, he was a lapdog if ever there was a lapdog. Anything Zemnus told him to do? He'd do it. I guess some um, habits from his time with the Master of Masters never really changed. The goal of this Organization 13 was to create a new King of Hearts that would fill their empty husks of bodies with hearts to call their own. But actually it wasn't. It was actually to create 13 vessels for Xehanort to possess when the time was ready. So, uh, nobodies can just grow hearts on their own by being people, hanging out, eating ice cream while your legs precariously dangle on the top of a gigantic building. Why do they do that, you know? So much is gonna get hurt. Lucia was among the only in the first organization to know of its true purpose and willingly work with Xemnas to further his goals. You see what I mean, Lapdog? But unfortunately for the organization, a boy, a duck, a dog, another boy, but this one's gay, and Kyrie all teamed up to take on their home in the world that never was. And, uh, they cleaned a house, like a, like a fresh slate. There was murder everywhere that night, including Zigbar. But is this the end for our eye patch wearing underling? No, the, uh, the, the answer is no. See, when you defeat a person's heartless and they're nobody, they come back as they're somebody. And Lushu, still on board with the whole become Xehanort plan, was all game to keep on going as an underling. That is, until Xehanort was defeated, and finally after all these years, he got his gazing eye Keyblade back. So in general, Keyblades are just kind of magic snorts, with a few unique abilities every master, i.e. Lushu, should know. You got your basic spells, you know, fire, blizzard, and thunder, but then you can just stop time and inflict the force of gravity and reflect. Oh my god, reflect. Keyblades can also unlock any lock they come across and can be used to release a person's heart. That's heart with a capital H. It is not an organ, but essentially is a manifestation of a person's personality in tangible form. But once a heart goes, that person goes. No heartless, no nobody, just death. Straight up death. But I mean, it's kind of hard to get to the point where you can take a person's heart out. They basically need to be unconscious, or you could use this one special keyblade, but Lucy doesn't have it, so it doesn't matter. But even then, if he relies on his heart to guide him, Nothing can stand in the way of the lost master, Lushu. May your heart be your guiding key. We open to the womb of the Tornin Titan, both Minoth and Adam resting from their long day of fighting monsters and putting up with Mithra. As they are sleeping, a wandering Lushu parades through the Tornin capital of Oresco, scouting out the area he was suddenly sent into, black box in tow. Eventually, he finds his way to the Tornin Titan's womb and sees both Minoth and Adam. He then, seeing an opportunity to toy with somebody, teleports over to their location and says to them, Morning, sleepyhead. But before he can finish those two words, Adam's sword is stuck up to his throat, with Minoth's gun knives closely following him. Heeding the warning, Lushu scrapes back a safe distance from the duo. I don't remember seeing your sorry face around these parts, stranger. I was about to say the same thing, Minoth. I don't know if you know this, but around these parts, I'm royalty. So you better have a good excuse as to why you were inches away from me as I slept. Lushu, regaining his composition, begins to speak up in defense of himself. Oh, I don't know if it's a good excuse per se, but it's one that I've used since I was a boy. My heart simply guided me here. Your heart? What kind of nonsense are you on about? You call that nonsense? As if. I call it tradition. 
Besides, I don't even know how I got here. I was just wandering around with this black box. Next thing I know, I'm standing on the back of a dragon in some sort of capital. So, sorry if my explanation is a little shoddy, cause that's what this whole situation is for me. Something tells me, deep in my heart, that if I get rid of you and that prince you're hanging out with over there, I can get a ticket home. So, what do you say? Care to dance? Lu Xu then begins to raise his arrow guns on Minoth and Adam, clearly instigating a fight. Stay back, Karal. As Adam begins to speak up, Minot silences him as he steps forward. Steady yourself, Prince. Or did you not realize he was here for me? Maybe a spy for a Malthus. Maybe just a hooligan looking for a chance to take on the blade that helped fell Malos. Either way, this doesn't have to concern you. Just stay back and let the pages write themselves, Adam. Adam, heeding Minot's words, stands down as Minot now raises his gun knives against Lucius's arrow guns. Their eyes lock onto each other, noticing their matching scars on their left eyes. As their eyes lock, they also squint. An unspoken rule emerging in that. Whoever fires first, there will be hell to pay afterwards. And simultaneously, bullets are fired. Tons and tons line up the area between Lushu and Minoth in what appears to be a horizontal line, but only because every bullet fired has been released with enough precision to knock into a corresponding bullet fired by whoever fired its opponent. Now we're dancing, but I think it's time to shake things up. New backdrop! With those two little words, Lushu takes the torn wound that they were both fighting on and transforms it into something adjacent to a square platform with a line going downward from the center but stopping halfway. Adam, despite spectating the bullet barrage up until now, has seemingly disappeared from the battlefield. What the hell is going on here? Adam! Oh, uh, your little friend's fine. I can deal with him later. For now, you're gonna have to deal with me. Oh, your little friend's fine. I can deal with him later. For now, you're gonna have to deal with me. Lushu then teleports all around the space that he created firing pot shots at Minot from a distance. Then, he seemingly vanishes from the space at all. Except really, he perched himself atop a platform miles high from Minot, and begins sniping at the blade. Moving back to the platform, he walks upside down, taunting the indolent blade, while swinging his arrow guns around his fingers. While doing this, he notices something, and begins to say, Off reload! Minot notices him saying this, and begins to charge at the Lost Master. Not sure why you'd tell me when you're reloading, but I'm not complaining. Take this! As he runs up to slash at Lushu, the secret Keyblade Warrior smirks, as Minot had fallen right into his trap. Hope you had fun chasing after me. Did you really think I'd be stupid enough to tell you when I'm reloading? <laughs> as if. Oh, I think you've got it mixed there. See, I'm afraid you've fallen into my trap! As he says that, he drops one of his gun knives in gun mode, and as he's dropping, he switches it to knife mode, impaling Lucio's abdomen. As Minoth hits him, the illusory world around him fades, and Adam reappears. The prince sees Minoth reappearing in front of him, but still senses that this fight is ongoing, so he decides not to interfere. Minot, still in the air, detracts his blade from Lushu's body and they both fall to the floor. Lushu falling, and Minot flipping gracefully. Hope you enjoy this performance, my prince! I told you not to call me that. Minot then charges at the downed enemy before him, shouting out, Cyclone! And starts spinning voraciously, a gun in one hand, a knife in the other, constantly firing while slashing simultaneously. He then shouts, Crusetta! As he ducks under a failed projectile from Lushu, sending his own barrage of bullets the Lost Master's way, before getting back on his feet. Finally, he shouts, Espada! As he continuously slashes at Lushu, still dazed from the Crusetta, he then again sends bullet after bullet his way, damaging the very wound Minot had caused earlier with his stab into Lushu's torso. Wincing in pain, Lushu on the verge of death takes a stand, propping himself up with an arrow gun. You're just like... me. You wield darkness. And I can sense it in those bullets. You don't use them for evil. I can also sense that... your darkness is light. That's it. Darkness is light. Brilliant. But unfortunately for you, 
I have the power to use both darkness and light. But to do that, I have to use my full power. I was hoping to just skim a lot of that, but you've proven yourself quite the adversary. Well, I guess it can't be helped. And with those haunting words, Lucio's arrogance dissolved in both his hands, seemingly because Minoff had defeated him. But instead, there was another meaning present. Lucio lifts his right hand while his left is steady, arm reaching out towards Minoff, and he begins to materialize something. In a flash of light, the gazing eye keyblade is in Lucio's hand, and he grips it firmly. Ah, like an old blood. Probably old Coot won't mind me borrowing this. I don't know what you've done, but whatever it is ends here and now! As Minoth rushes into Lushu, the latter vanishes into nothingness, leaving behind nothing but scattered gray lines indicating his massive speed. As Minoth looks around to find his opponent, a grimacing Lushu appears at his side, smirking as he strikes the unknowing blade with a light-based attack. Oopsie daisy! Looks like I made you slip. Sorry about that, but I really need to get on. I've got a role to play after all. Oh, you've got a role? I'm a damn playwright, you asshole. And trust me, whatever role you play is destined to turn out dreadful. Now I know I cannot defeat you on my own. Not with that thing. But unlike you, I have friends. They are my power. So we will do this. Adam, noticing the gesture Minoth is getting at, gets up and stands by his side, sword in hand, before saying with the blade, TOGETHER! Heh, <laughs> not the first to say it, not the last, it seems. Let's settle this! As Adam and Minoth charge at Lushu, Minoth throws both his gun knives Adam's way. Ready to try that lore-inspired technique, Adam! More than anything, Minoth. Let's go! And with that, Adam begins firing the guns much to Lucius' chagrin, and when finished, slashes downward once. Then, passing one gun knife to Minoth, they begin continuously slashing the Keyblade Warrior, leaving mark after mark on his body, before simultaneously firing bullet after bullet his way. Finally, as the coup de grace, Adam throws his gun knife Minoth's way before Minoth screams, Escorpion! and charges up one huge blast out of both of his gun knives. <laughs> And with those remarks, nothing is left of the Lost Master that once occupied the area. Ha! Ah, splendid work, Minoth. Shall you celebrate this victory by immortalizing it in one of your stories? I don't think so, Adam. He was a lowlife. A nobody. He doesn't deserve to be immortalized. And besides... I'd much rather rest than do anything else right now. And with those words, the two men take to their rest once again, while the black box that was left unattended emanates a sinister light, indicating that perhaps something dire lies in the future for Torna. As all three of them charge at each other, Lushu strikes against Adam's blade with precision unknown to the prince, quickly and efficiently disarming him. To keep Minoth, who was readying an attack, at bay, he then uses another light-based spell on the blade. Shame your teamwork couldn't save you this time, heroes. He then slashes at Adam's chest, revealing Adam's heart to himself and Minoth. With one swipe, the stained glass material thing is shattered into pieces, leaving the Tornin Prince lifeless on the ground. Minoth tries crawling away, but Lucio keeps him in place with a stop spell. Darkness, light, it's all so binary. What I think the world needs is a little gray. And with those words, he impales his keyblade into Minoth's chest, completely shattering his human organs and core crystal broken beyond repair. As Minoth's fresh corpse slides sickly down gazing eye, Lushu begins to shake it off as it collides with the floor with a ponderous boom. After defeating them both, a door appears in front of Lushu, leading him back to his home world. <laughs> it's true then, what the Master always said. May my heart be my guiding key. And with those words, he walks into the door, picking up the black box along the way never to venture into the world of all rest ever again.
You know, sometimes you just try to fight for yourself, and that's okay. Now allow me to answer some questions, though there probably aren't too many aspects of the fight to talk about in depth that weren't presented with reasoning in the fight. The biggest thing, at least to me, was allowing Lushu to use the Gazing Eye Keyblade. Technically, in the point in time the fight supposedly takes place, Lushu shouldn't have access to this weapon as it's being used by Xehanort. That's why he has a line about borrowing it from the old coot. But I thought it'd be insincere to represent Lushu, a Keyblade master, and only have him use weapons that he used as Zigbar. And the other other thing is Adam. Having him participate in the fight may seem weird to some, as maybe it's one of the few blades in the franchise that can fully function on its own without a driver. But getting rid of that driver blade relationship, I feel like gets rid of the point of having a Xenoblade Chronicles 2 character in your versus show. With exceptions, of course. But I don't think Minoth is one of them. His time with Adam was so important to him that he spent 500 fucking years producing the same goddamn play where he deliberates a story. And, not to mention, you get rid of a Scorpion by getting rid of Adam. So, I feel like I'm right to use Adam. Also, when the fuck else is anybody gonna give this boy some love? I might as well do it. Now, in terms of Arsenal, they were both pretty evenly matched. Manoth actually had more arts than Lucia did unique arrow gun attacks, so he won in versatility. But once Gaze Guy comes out, it's a whole different story. There are multiple spells Lucia should have direct access to, including those of the light element. This element is super effective against dark element blades, such as Minoth, so once Gazing Eye comes into play, Lucia gains a huge advantage. But even then, Minoth's teamwork with Adam and experience in taking down the ultra powerful Mallows certainly helped him. So overall, Minoth had the teamwork and versatility to keep Lucia on his toes, but Lucia, given the time to actually summon Gazing Eye, had an elemental advantage that could exploit Minoth's weakness as well as the ability to reshape the arena to his advantage. So let us know, who do you think would win? Comment below, and before we leave you, here's a trailer for the next episode. Bye.